I want to uh, greet my old friend Harold Morowitz, who I can see, but I, understand, I know he can't see me. Harold and I go back uh, more than 50 years, and our, our uh, friendship, which began with both of us working on an obscure group of microorganisms who are the smallest free-living microorganisms, the mycoplasma. So hello to you, Harold. Um, I want to begin my presentation by defining a couple of key words and concepts in this field that I find are misunderstood. I want to define them, at least for purposes of, of my presentation. It reminds me very much of the experience of a European colleague of mine that he had when he arrived at Kennedy Airport and was detained there by the customs inspectors when they found in his briefcase a manuscript entitled The Effect of Free Radicals and Other Foreign Agents on Red Cells. <laughs> so uh, not wanting to put you in a position of completely misunderstanding what I'm talking about, I'm going to define my terms. Okay, so I need this gadget. There are only two ways in which age changes can occur. The first is a pur purposeful program driven by genes, or a stochastic or randomly occurring cascade of accidental events. There are four aspects of the finitude of life. The first is aging. The second is longevity determination. There's uh, critical differences between the two, and I'll discuss that. The third are age-associated diseases, and finally, death. I won't discuss death other than to say that death is nature's way of telling you to slow down. The first aspect, then, of the finitude of life is aging, and we find that there is no direct evidence that supports the common belief that aging is the result of a genetic program. No gene that codes for a generally accepted biomarker of aging has been found. And incidentally, we don't have any good biomarkers of aging. Chronological age, of course, is out of the question. Animate and inanimate objects re require no instructions to age. Everything in the universe ages for the same reason. For example, your car is brilliant because it knows how to age without any instructions either in the car itself or in the blueprints. It just ages. A huge body of knowledge exists indicating that age changes are characterized by the loss of molecular structure and the molecules of both animate and inanimate objects. So why is the second law of thermodynamics the probable cause of aging? It governs the behavior of all molecules, it can explain the ultimate cause of all other theories of aging. It is testable using current technologies. It's falsifiable. It is universal and applies to both animate and inanimate objects, which is the main thrust of this workshop. Why is aging not determined by genes? <clears throat> genes are unnecessary to drive a spontaneous process. Blueprints contain no information instructing a car or any other inanimate object how, how to age. Age changes are universal phenomena. Analogously, the genome also does not contain instructions that govern uh, aging. In fact, aging is an artifact of human civilization. It only occurs in humans or in the animals that we choose to protect. It is, in fact, an artifact. Teleologically, it was never intended for us to see in the first place, since we've learned how to extend our longevity. So human aging is unique. The extreme manifestations of aging are, are unique to us and the animals that we choose to protect. Feral animals don't age because when the process starts, they're culled by predation, disease, or accidents. Uh, by learning how to eliminate pred our predators, prevent or delay our diseases and accidents, 
we've revealed age changes in their extreme that we might argue was never intended for us to, uh, to experience. <clears throat> Aging then is an artifact of human civilization. The second aspect that I want to discuss is longevity determination. Age changes must occur in molecules that first exist without age changes. Longevity is determined by the length of time that repair, synthesis, and maintenance processes can retain the active state of biomolecules. When molecules composing the repair, synthesis, and maintenance processes themselves eventually succumb to the same irreparable reduced energy states as does their substrate molecules, the aging pro process becomes manifest at higher levels of biological organization. The repair shops also age. The genome indirectly determines longevity. The genome governs events from life's beginning until reproductive maturation, after which many of the events that, continues, that it continues to govern are overtaken by the aging process. In youth, the efficiency of repair, synthesis, and maintenance of molecules is favored over the continued loss of molecular structure in substrate molecules. After reproductive success, the balance slowly shifts as dysfunctional molecules accumulate because their numbers exceed repair <coughs> and maintenance capacity. So the genome indirectly determines longevity. Unlike the chance process that characterizes aging, longevity determination is not a chance process. Longevity is governed by the enormous excess capacity or physiological reserve reached at the time of reproductive maturity. For example, two kidneys, two lungs, huge heart capacity, etc. This redundancy is achieved through natural selection to better guarantee survival to the age of reproductive success. So the determination of longevity is incidental to the main goal of the genome, which is to reach reproductive maturity. So let's compare aging determinants versus longevity determinants. Longevity determination is an entirely different process from the aging process. <clears throat> One might think of longevity determination as the energy state of molecules before they incur age changes. In other words, why do we live as long as we do? One might think of aging as the state of molecules as they continue to incur irreparable states of dysfunction or the question, why do things eventually go, go wrong? Aging then is a catabolic process that is chance driven Longevity determination is an anabolic process that indirectly is genome driven. Now the third aspect of the finitude of life are age associated diseases. Here are six reasons why aging is not a disease, contrary to the belief of a lot of people. Unlike any disease, age changes occur in every animal that reaches a fixed size in adulthood. I was going to discuss this later, but I, I unfortunately will not have time to do that. Uh, age changes, un unlike any disease, age changes occur in almost every species. Unlike any disease, age changes occur in all species members only after the age of reproductive maturation. Unlike any disease, age changes occur in zoo animals protected by humans, even after that species probably has not experienced aging aging for thousands or even mil millions of years. We find a new species in the jungle, take it to the zoo, and it undergoes a process called aging. Uh, not a surprise to anyone. But it probably never occurred, or rarely if ever occurred in a wild. Fifth age, uh, unlike any disease, age changes increase the vulnerability to pathology and death in all animals in which it occurs. And finally, <clears throat> age changes have the same universal molecular cause, that is accumulation of dysfunctional molecules in both animate and inanimate objects. There's no disease or pathology that shares these six criteria that characterize the aging process. <clears throat> 
Will disease resolution increase our understanding of the fundamental biology of aging? I raised this question for a very important reason that will be explained shortly. Our success in resolving childhood diseases like polio, iron deficiency anemia, Wilms tumors, etc., did not increase our understanding of childhood development. And in a similar way, the resolution of the leading causes of death, and I list them here, will provide no insights into the fundamental etiology of aging. So what if all of the leading causes of death written on death certificates, which is the key phrase, were to be resolved? Suppose we didn't need medical schools anymore, or physicians, or nursing, or any of the, of, of the uh, <coughs> kinds of health uh, preventive and and resolving methods that we currently have. In developed countries, there could only be an increase in life expectancy of about 13 years. Um, this is being blocked. Uh, I think it reads 70, yes, yeah, 79 years is the average life expectancy at birth in the US today, roughly. So about 92 years would be the maximum average life expectancy attainable if all causes of death were to be resolved. The increase in years of life expectancy if leading causes of death were resolved have been calculated as follows at two different ages listed here. Uh, if we were to resolve causes of death caused by cardiovascular disease and stroke, these are the numbers of additional years of life expectancy at those ages. If cancer were cured tomorrow morning, this would be the increase in life expectancy. If accidents were somehow to be resolved, this would be the increase. All other causes would produce these numbers. The data is obtained from these two sources and actually from several other sources that I'm not listing here. If all causes of death currently written on death certificates would be resolved, then what would cause death? we wouldn't be immortal as a result of that miracle. What would happen is that the manifestations of the aging process would be the cause of most deaths. Accidents, homicide, war, suicide, of course, may never be eliminated. The aging process, which commonly begins well before most age-associated diseases appear, would simply continue. And a new vocabulary would be required to describe causes of death attributable to the loss of physiological capacity in some vital organ or organs. Why are most, age, most diseases today age associated? They weren't a century ago. The milieu created by the appearance and or the accumulation of second law induced dysfunctional biomolecules provides conditions that increase vulnerability for further modifications that lead to the appearance of age-associated diseases. The dysfunctional molecules also appear in repair, synthesis, and disposal systems uh, to accelerate the aging process and further increase vulnerability to pathology. Unlike what occurs in young cells, the increasing accumulation of unrepaired or retained dysfunctional molecules explains the occurrence of age-associated phenomena, some of them trivial, like those listed here, and some serious. This reasoning suggests something very important, and that is that all age-associated diseases may have a common etiology that is favored by the milieu of old cells, or at least the leading edge of a lineage of cells. How old is a living form if all of its <coughs> molecules turn over periodically? Determining the age of some biological material is very difficult. Most of our cells pr present today were formed no more than a few years ago. Some were formed a few minutes ago or fractions of a second ago. We don't know of any cells or molecules proven to be present at birth and that survive to our present age. After about 20 population doublings, the smallest molecules are discarded or diluted to the vanishing point. So the essential quality of sameness of the organism ultimately disappears. 
If all of our cells or the molecules that compose them turn over in only a few years, then what do you celebrate on your birthday? <laughs> what does not seem to age is information, and information only. DNA, even in gametes and their precursors, is not immortal, despite Weissman's claim that germ cells are immortal. But the information it contains comes close. DNA turns over. Because of the essential role of mutations and recombination, information in DNA changes. The only aspect of biology that approaches, but doesn't quite make it uh, for immortality, is this flow of information. The most important question in research on the biology of aging, I think, is at first at the cell level, why are old cells in a lineage more vulnerable to disease and pathology than are young cells in that lineage? And at the molecular level, what modifications occur in functional biomolecules that result in age changes and increased vulnerability to age-associated pathology? The most important question in research on longevity determination is this. How can the energetic states of functional biomolecules be maintained longer? I want to address a political issue, a very significant one, because it, in fact, has been behind some of the former questions, and that is, what is research on aging? The rubric aging research embraces all aspects of the finitude of life. Biogerontologists do research on the fundamental biology of aging, which is only one tiny part of what's included in the general term aging research. There is a common belief held especially by policymakers and funding agencies that to fund aging research means to fund research on age-associated diseases, and that this will somehow provide insights into the fundamental biology of aging. It won't, and this has in fact become a $1 billion misunderstanding. There's relatively little support for research on the biology of aging. Contrary to popular belief, no research support is directed toward understanding the fundamental biology of human aging that is even remotely comparable to the support for research on age-associated diseases. For example, in recent years, less than 5% of the National Institute on Aging budget was spent on research on the fundamental biology of aging, and half of that budget, budget was spent on Alzheimer's research, the res resolution of which will add 19 days onto human life expectancy. I'm not arguing that we stop research on Alzheimer's disease, but I'd like to put it in a perspective equivalent to what we're spending on fundamental biology of aging. And, and in fact, in the past five years, the Alzheimer's disease budget increased by $200 million. The research budget for aging remained the same. Uh, I am going to propose that every physician, with a few exceptions, utters the following mantra. The greatest risk factor for the leading causes of death, cardiovascular disease, stroke, and cancer, is the aging process. Well, I don't think it takes an education beyond the ninth grade to ask this question. So why is the funding for research on the fundamental biology of aging infinitesimal when compared to the funding for research on age-associated diseases? I think the probable reason is a failure of many to distinguish aging from disease. Thank you. <laughs> So, so how do we know that, I mean, you argue that all, that you know, non-living systems age and living systems age, and how do we know that if we didn't get, that there aren't genes that if we somehow changed them, got rid of them, did whatever, that the fundamental limits of human aging due to physical mechanisms wouldn't be a thousand years? I mean, in other, in other words, it seems like just because there are, given that we don't have any theory which predicts how long a system should last given, let's say, physical aging, we don't know to what extent genes or specific biological mechanisms that protect young individuals might or might not be relevant. I don't know how you conclude that it's not relevant, That's, which I think you, you try well, to. First of all, I can't prove a negative. And secondly, uh, uh, anything is 
is possible, but the probability is very low. And I would consider what you propose to be a very low probability of, of, of understanding this, this process. Because if the process is universal, then um, inanimate objects don't have genes or don't have directions telling it how to age if the process is identical to the process that occurs in bi biological material, which I think it does. Uh, the, the other very important point to make, <clears throat> I've just made it, but I'll make it again because I'm sure it's going to apply to some subsequent questions, and that is the failure of the uh, leadership in uh, policy and funding distribution in this country, and in most developed countries, in fact, to apply, to uh, encourage research on the fundamental biology of aging. We simply have very few questions that can be answered about that process. Very <coughs> few, if any. I want to applaud that. Please. Yes. Yep. Sorry, back there. Oh, uh, okay. I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> I want to applaud that statement because back in what was it, the late mid '60s, when we first put a big push in on Congress for have funding in the basic process of bio, the biology of aging, that finally went through. As soon as the dollars came out, it went exclusively to health care, diseases of aging. How long can, you know, should you bring mm -hmm. food home to the individuals, et cetera, et cetera? Yes. Well, the Institute of Aging, when we started that, did exactly the same. Yeah. Well, thank you for that observation. I agree with it completely. I was, I was a founding member of the Council of the NIA, and so I'm well aware of its original policies and what <laughs> transcribed subsequently. Um, unfortunately, and I will apologize in advance to the physicians present in this audience, but the medical paradigm prevailed. And that's a tough paradigm to overturn, especially when the decisions are being made by physicians who have specific age-associated disease interests. It would be a very worthwhile project to understand how the current interest in Alzheimer's disease and its enormous funding arose. It started actually with Bob Butler, the first director of the NIA, who later apologized publicly, as you probably know, for uh, emphasizing research on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, in any case, that's just one illustration of this serious problem. So, uh, yeah, I. I uh, uh, very much enjoyed your talk, and I agree with the spirit of it, but I want to address I have several questions. I'm going to limit to two. One is the question of the role of genes versus just the physical process of degradation and entropy production. And that is that um, presumably um, genes, it, genes must play a role in terms of at least determining the amount, the allocation of energy to repair. That is, the genes presumably determine that um, you do live to um, a reproductive age and so forth and produce enough offspring and maximize your fitness and so forth. So genes play a kind of a hidden secondary role in this picture. Uh, secondly, um, I, I, I don't quite understand your statement that um, aging didn't occur before we became social animals, we as human beings. Namely, that uh, just go to your automobile example, um, as soon as you drive it off the lot, that automobile starts aging. And, and How is that defined? Well, that's the question. That's what I was bringing up. How do you, what, you didn't make a specific definition of aging and in I terms of a, a way of quantifying what that means. Because as soon as you're born, after all, damage starts occurring, even though you're growing and developing. And of course, the development is, is much greater than the damage uh, that is occurring due to fluctuations so on. So in that sense, if you, if you identify aging with damage and wear and tear, then of course it begins at, at, at birth, that aging process. Yes, so well, so it's a question, so it's a question of clarifying that. 
Well, I agree with you completely. I never said that aging begins at a specific time, and I agree it begins at the moment of con conception, conception, probably. Uh, but the uh, balance from that point to reproductive maturity is in favor of repair, synthesis, and turnover processes. After that, there's a slow change because there is no, uh, uh, no reason for natural selection to uh, extend longevity beyond that point. In fact, there's, a very, there's an amusing uh, anec uh, anecdote about that philosophy, and that is, it is called in this business the cheap watch, cheap watch analogy. If you and I decide to found a company that produces pocket watches for $2 that are guaranteed to last for one year, uh, we become very successful. But we, and we find that some of those watches, in fact, go beyond one year, a well, year and a half, maybe even two years. But we don't build into that watch a uh, mechanism to make it stop working on the 366th day. It's just not worth the effort and the energy expenditure. So the same thing in general, we think, applies to biological material, although there are some exceptions to that, uh, what are called big bang animals. Do you all know what big bang animals are? Like, like the Pacific salmon? Animals that uh, reach a stage of reproduction, and after that, one member of the species, usually the males, die almost immediately. And uh, the reason for that has been speculated upon. There are lots of theories. Uh, so Big Bang animals seem to be uh, somewhat of, of an exception. Now, to get to, to answer your other question, uh, uh, and I think it referred to... Uh, well, I'm just uh, well, uh, uh, the fact that genes play a role. In this yes, well, there's, there's no question. The Look, what I said applies to all molecules. And if you believe genes are composed of molecules, then the argument of the application of the second law applies to genes as well. It applies well, to every molecule. That, but nevertheless, the determinant, I mean, after all, um, if I buy a car, I expect it to last maybe 10 years. But I can make that car last 100 years if I... If well, I, I, would, uh, no, I would argue that you can't for the following reason. If you want to make it last 100 years, you're going to have to replace parts. Exactly. When in the process of parts replacement does that car uh, uh, not be, not be, is not the same car that you bought? It's the same argument for antique car owners. Are those cars actually antiques when 50% or more of the parts have been replaced by remanufactured parts? or new parts? It's an interesting philosophical question. Back here? Yeah. So oh. I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so th this, this may be a naive question, but if it's, if it's fundamentally the second law that's driving uh, uh, this deterioration, then why is, why is it only applying over the course of one organism rather than from generation to generation? In other words, each generation seems to be more or less as good as, as, good as the one previous to it. So if nature effectively has found a way to reset the second law every time we reproduce, fun why fundamentally shouldn't it be able to do that within an in individual? Well, it's, uh, it is the differences that you're concerned with are, are concerned with, uh, with uh, longevity determinants and not aging. <laughs> aging is a deteriorative process. Uh, the, are you are you uh, concerned about individuals within a species or or interspecies differences in longevity? I guess I'm saying, is it, if, if it's fundamentally the second law yeah. that prevents uh, uh, an individual organism from living a thousand years, let's say, then why isn't that same deterioration happening happening from generation to generation? Well, it is. I don't understand why. Well, you're I don't uh, know, I'm not 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 three <laughs> million. Yeah. Three million years old, but that's how old human species are. Yeah. Why don't errors accumulate in the Because the rec there is a phenomenal, a phenomenal uh, capacity for repair during meiosis, well, and we that, think. Why that happen? Yeah, why couldn't? But from a fundamental well, physics point of view, why couldn't that be? Happening? From a fundamental yeah. physics point of view, it probably could happen, but it doesn't in biological material. You want to program in a limited lifespan because 
the only way to adapt to the changing environment is to change. Right? Yeah, no. So you have to have generations yeah, to change. That's an argument of the dead. Yes. That's like the dead. Well, the question of whether it's 100 years, 1,000 years, or a million years, right. is then determined by this allocation to uh, the power. Yeah, well, there's, turnover, there's molecular turnover constantly. So uh, it, uh, depending on your definition of immortality or longevity, uh, it must uh, be a function of those three properties of biological material. Let's see. That, that. So the, this is, in a way, a follow-on to Jeff's remark that in a car, different kinds of car have different lifetimes. And the lifetime of the car is encrypted in its blueprints. Now, it isn't necessarily intentionally encrypted in the blueprints, although many of us think that it actually is. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be. Now, uh, so there's, there's the sort of a bigger concept implicit in the conversation, which is that engineering a thing is difficult. Making, making a, comp a complicated uh, st structure is difficult. And that's sort of what the fundamentals of aging is. It's the difficulty of engineering a complex thing that will last a long time. It's expensive and difficult. Now, apropos of the molecular damage, things like cars can also age by virtue of systemic problems. So it can also happen that the parts themselves are perfectly fine, but what goes or muck is the way they relate to each other. And that's part of the, that's in the blueprints also, but it, it isn't in the details of the microscopic parts. Now, it, it strikes me that when you're trying to understand aging for the purposes of health, it's like understanding the process of aging for a car where you have a specific engineering thing in mind, namely to make it slow down. Namely, what you're looking for ways that you can make intervention and uh, uh, let's say, well, let's say intervene in certain weak places where the system is ru running amok. And therefore, finding which of these mechanisms by which the system doesn't starts failing is important. Namely, there's a, is, is, it, is it in fact uh, mistakes that happen in stem cells, for example? If it is, that suggests uh, an approach to making it slow down. Similarly, if there's a systemic problem of how the system works, that suggests a way of how to intervene. So it, 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 what strikes me in the conversation is that, is that um, there's no logical prioritization of all the, of, of, of how to investigate all the different things, the different ways that the system could just mess up because designing it to last a long time is difficult and expensive. Well, yes, I, I agree with virtually everything that you've said. I think the analogy with an, with an automobile or any other mechanical entity is, is apt, uh, with the exception that most of those entities, like automobiles, don't contain their own repair mechanisms. That as obvious, and it's why we go to repair shops. But we have to remember that the repair shops also age, and uh, that is occurring uh, systemically. Can I point out one interesting counterexample? It's just a practical engineering matter. Obviously, the, in, the atoms in your motor are immortal. Okay, so if at the level of atoms, you don't have to worry about them because they're you know they're well designed. They can, but it turns out that the metals in your, in your car parts heal. That's one of the special things about metals. They're very different from brittle substances. Uh, they, they, have, they don't heal forever. You know, if you, if you bend a wire back and forth long enough, it'll fatigue and fail. But the reason that metals are ductile is because they have this quantum mechanical way of repairing themselves when they're, when they're plastically deformed. And so repair at the inanimate level actually is, is central to much of modern engineering.
Does everybody here buy that? I'll tell you more about it. But we, we, we know that the, the system is very open. Biological systems is an open system. It takes energy and you use it through these uh, whatever genes and, uh, and proteins to repair it. So the very fact that you can repair is, the fa is, is uh, uh, proof that the system is a very open system. It takes in energy and, and do its work. But this right? gentleman says that repair occurs also in automobile, in mechanical. That could very well okay. be, but yeah, so, so um, but in, in biologic system, you design that evolution select the system su such a, such, in such a way that it correct the mistake that it makes to the extent that you maintain a certain capacity, what you mentioned about repair. So what is, what is uh, the selected capacity of repair? Uh, I think that's the question that determines the, uh, uh, as a pro byproduct, the, the aging of the, of the system. Because according to what you said is that the capacity, uh, seems to be the capacity of repair is evolved to make sure you survive <coughs> uh, until the age of your, of your reproduction. And whatever you get beyond that is just the bonus of this capacity of repair that you mm -hmm. evolved to. Um, so well, is that? R repair is an enormous capacity of activity in any biological material. Uh, DNA repair, and I think uh, Arnie can speak to this m more expertly than I can, but repair of DNA is occurring, what, 10,000 times a second? Oh, yeah, it's quite, yeah. I think that's an underestimate. So there's enormous capacity for repair at the fundamental level of information containing molecules. Uh, to say nothing of what happens at higher or, uh, levels of organization. But in principle, you can make the repair system even better than what it is now, well, and you therefore know. you can live forever. Is that the, what's at the limit? Is that the, re the capacity of the repair itself or something else? A any, any argument like that is possible, but highly improbable. I, I was just going to say, I think repair is optimized by the environment's repair. In other words, E. coli, for example, changes its mutation rate in response to uh, the environmental changes. In other words, uh, its repair processes could be altered by the environment. It's so, over well, yeah, I mean, so you, <laughs> you might be in bad shape if you try to over repair. You have to come to some equilibrium with the environment. So I, I think that you can change any of these things, the error rate, the repair rate, and it's it's sensors with the environment. So, uh, but there's no, ev so there's evidence that you're you know, potentially optimized with your environment. If your environment changes, you just need to breed a few generations to respond to that. But I also I think that uh, the repair appears in a very high non-equilibrium state. And I think Chris will tell us more about it, but I think that this repair appearing in a highly non-equilibrium state has a, dam has a penalty, entropic penalty. So every time you repair, you actually accumulate some damage. Mm -hmm. So eventually, like a bridge is going to fall, no matter how many mm -hmm. times you, uh, yeah. you do that. You just. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else in the Chris's question about the germ line? Well, I think that you answered that question. question. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, the germ line, I think that Len actually uh, addressed actually, a little bit. There's an so he said that. I think it's a question. Why? No, no, no. No, the question, I think that he actually addressed it. He said that the information, in some sense, is immortal. Yes. And this is why the germ line. No, because it's it's a very because it's a very high penalty to re, uh, uh, redo the whole column again because that column has to operate. You have to eat. You have to uh, uh, extract nutrients all the time. You can't stop for a month, uh, replace the whole column with the information of one cell, and then start again because this column has to operate. The same is with the heart. The heart has to uh, keep doing what it's doing. So it doesn't divide as many times. So why I think we, that. Why don't we repair one kidney completely while the other one functions? I mean, you okay, kidney. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think that the tissue is organized in such a way that it doesn't do that. But 
but maybe I'm wrong. Okay, that's biology. That's right, but that's biology. You know, yeah. It's not being driven fundamentally. Right, right, right. No, I, I agree with that. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I, mean, I think the problem is that it's what, we're not made by an engineer. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, you're asking questions that an engineer would ask about how to build the body, <laughs> but we're made in a random process that then gets selected upon to function. And we're far from perfect. I mean, we may be a really bad car. I mean, means that we should be able to make a synthetic plate, which uh, oh, we might be able to, and which will last forever and ever by minimizing, like Bob said, the complexity of the creation itself so that moving parts are minimal. Can I get the fundamental physics limit? Right. That's no, I understand. It's just that's not the way it happened, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Can I make a mumble about the engineer thing? Because because that's on my mind right now. Is a fact that real engineering works this way too. We have this myth that it's logical, but in fact, there's this random process that happens inside a company where really stupid mistakes get made because there is not, there is not, I'm, this is, I'm not making this up. This is, at, the actual engineering that we actually live with is kind of a random process where you make intelligent choices of things to try, but the selection of what eventually gets made uh, has many other components and is really stochastic. So uh, there's so very little the difference. The initial design. In, he said he didn't want the cost to last forever for economic reasons. And so he would like this to fail at some point. So there's very little difference between biology and uh, inanimate objects. I think so. I would agree. OK, next. Yeah. When I think of uh, most organs, you can come up with pretty good metrics for aging uh, that are in, in process. And of course, they have uh, a lot to do with uh, lifetime exposure to uh, you know, certain uh, stimuli, heart, uh, kidney, skin. Uh, but the brain is a less clear, the brain is a less clear case uh, because it's not obvious that there's objective evidence of intrinsic deterioration of brain function uh, in contrast. Mitochondria go to hell? But then, well, the whole, the mitochondrial story is a very interesting one, isn't it? Because, you know, you have this, uh, the system is in a bit of a cul-de-sac from a uh, metabolic point of view. But you do have these uh, long-term survivors, supercentarians, uh, who seem to be uh, you know, functioning at a high level. So uh, you think not. You think that if you, if you test them adequately and look for metabolic capacity. Supercentarians, so those are over 110. You don't want to be a supercentarian. It's too late. You wear out before that. There's a, there's a mission that we've got around 105. 110 brain year old people. Brain included. Brain included. Okay, so that's the, mm -hmm. the neuronal, neuronal cells and muscular cells have very low uh, turnover rates, right? Well, they may have a low turnover rate as individual cells, but the, there is probably a much higher turnover rate of the individual constituent molecules. So to argue that a neuron, sorry? Do we actually know that? We have data on that, oh yes. Because we know that synthesis is, occur is occurring in those cells. But the molecules, I mean, after all, the brain is a very unique organ, as are muscles, that they have to have memory, right? So to, to maintain integrity over long periods of time. So yeah. you're the same person. From information to many molecules, of course. Years ago, yes, yes. Is very different than your liver or your skin yes. and so forth. Well, those experiments should be done, but as I remarked before, I think twice now, uh, it, it, those questions are ignored. For example, I just hinted at an entire class of animals, hundreds of species that do not age, or at least the, if they are aging, the rate is imperceptible. The problem is compounded by the fact that we have no biomarkers, reliable biomarkers for biological aging. If you want to measure a rate change in humans, what are you going to measure? Uh, and, and if you have some kind of uh, nostrum that you think is going to affect uh, aging, what are you going to measure? And uh, we have no such measure, no ways of making those measurements that are reliable. How about uh, capacities of organs? 
capacitance? Well, you know, organs deteriorate, and there must there are measures of uh, you know. I mean, I go to my doctor, and he well, looks at but charts no, that no, tell me no that one age. has correlated those changes with age. It's as simple as that. There, you you so, have to understand that there are a handful of people doing research in this field for the past fifty years. So, last question, and then we. You brought up something that I certainly never had uh, put together. Anyhow, I knew that, as you said, there are organisms like fish which grow, continue to grow throughout their life, uh, and get larger and larger and larger, or I guess lobsters and so forth, and that uh, at very old ages are extremely competent in all of their functions that have been tested. Um, uh, and that correlation, and so they don't seem to age. And, and the, but the don't seem to age and the continual growth throughout life is the correlation or association Seems that I be. have never yes. thought about before. Yes. In other words, the fact that we come to some equilibrium in exactly. scale and size fixes us for the for downturn. That's right. And if, you, if we could continue to grow, <laughs> Uh, over, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> grow in the right direction. <laughs> so, <laughs> direction is not, the vector is important here. That's, <laughs> if we, I, I mean, if that's, I don't understand the correlation, but it is the correlation. Nobody you understands yeah. the correlation, to the best of my knowledge, but it is a rule of thumb. Uh, and we know very little about it for the reasons I have been giving for the past 10 minutes. Uh, there is not a single grant that has been awarded by the NIA that I'm aware of, at least in recent years, that is directed toward understanding what's happening to uh, ageless animals. Why? I don't understand it. <laughs>